you'll notice he was born right around the time that Luther is tacking his 95 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg Castle. So both Knox and Calvin were the next generation from Luther. Zwingli wasn't. Zwingli was the same generation as, as Luther. But Knox and Calvin were the next generation. He's born in Scotland. That's probably a shock. Sometime around 1532, again, the records are unclear. He's ordained a priest. So once again, a long line of Protestant reformers who were ordained priests in the Catholic Church. The Reformation was a, a revolution from within. It was not a revolution from without. In 1546, an event happens that changes <laughs> Knox's life. There's a Protestant preacher named George Wishart who was executed as a heretic by the Catholic Church. So keep in mind, yes, they executed some people as heretics. The Protestants did it in Geneva. They did it in Zurich. But the Catholic Church was executing people as heretics also. And Knox had a close relationship with Wishart as Wishart went around the, the countryside uh, preaching uh, the, the evangelical doctrine. Knox was his bodyguard. He did a good job, didn't he? Uh, Mark, yeah, <laughs> didn't do a very good job. And the thing is, uh, Knox, there's some stuff about him that you couldn't make up. He lived such a colorful and varied life. So this is the first one, is he's a hired bodyguard for a Protestant evangelical preacher. You think of bodyguards, you think of, you know, big, curly big, guys. Tough guys. Is, is that John Knox? Is he a... Uh, here he is. Notice the, <laughs> notice the hat? Cool hat. Cool hat. It's more of a Sam Elliott look, really. Ooh. 1547, a, a nascent Protestant movement is growing in, in Scotland. And there was a, uh, a revolt against the Roman Catholic Church. They capture the castle of St. Andrews during this revolt. During a golf game. Now, this revolt is not, uh, dare I say, is not well planned. Uh, it's not well thought out. They do hold the castle for a while. And during that period that they're holding the castle, Knox, who was a part of it, becomes the preacher to the revolutionary Protestants who have seized the castle. So this is where he starts his evangelical preaching. When he is captured, finally, when the, the Catholics take the castle back over again, and you can't make this stuff up. He's made a galley slave. In 1549, he's released from a galley imprisonment, and he starts preaching in England. So he had an impact in England also. And he becomes the confessor to the king, to Edward VI. Isn't which a confessor Catholic? Uh, well, more like personal spiritual advisor is okay. maybe the, the better way to put it. Uh, 1554, he flees England because Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, yes. has taken over England. And Bloody Mary is returning uh, Catholicism to England. And I should mention, 300 Protestant leaders are killed during her reign. Uh, as she's trying to drive out the Protestant influence and bring the Catholics back. So he <laughs> flees to Geneva, that shining beacon, that city of God, run by John Calvin. And he becomes a student of John Calvin. He also becomes a preacher to uh, the English population in Geneva. So uh, here, uh, so keep track so far, he's a Catholic priest, he's a bodyguard, he's a galley slave, He's a spiritual advisor to the King of England, and now he's officially becomes the most important role of his life, a crony of John Calvin. 1559, he uh, returns to Scotland, and we're going to talk about the political situation in Scotland in a moment, so don't worry. He returns to Scotland and starts going around the countryside preaching uh, ever more intemperate uh, sermons against Catholicism. And he preaches against idolatry, and uh, monasteries are sacked. Uh, people attack churches. They tear down the relics from the wall. They tear down the paintings, uh, the statuary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They preach against idolatry. That was primarily um, uh, the Virgin Mary. It, it, Virgin Mary would be part of that, but it wasn't all of it. Calvin and Knox and Luther felt that the Catholic Church had, be some, had become so focused on statuary and iconography and uh, relics, and, all relics and paintings 
that they felt that people had started to worship the relics and, and the statues rather than worshiping God. Uh, a similar thing happened uh, with, with Luther. I mean, the, the, the populace rose up against the, the church in Germany uh, because of Luther's preaching. He eventually quelled it because he thought it was getting out of hand, but the same thing happened in, in Germany. 1560, the, most, uh, the real most important event in the life of John Knox occurs. The Scottish Parliament establishes the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. So, if you're looking for the actual date where the Presbyterian Church, as we know it today as a denomination, is started, it's in 1560 in Scotland. But obviously, it is based on the theology of Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin, who collectively we refer to as the Reformed Church. Have I mentioned Calvin and, and Zwingli in this class? <laughs> I, I can't remember if I did. So sometimes Knox is referred to as the father of Presbyterianism as opposed to Calvin. Uh, take your pick. 1560 to 67, John Knox takes on one of the most important roles of his life, and that is to bring down a sovereign. And uh, I have a slide coming up. We're going to talk about Mary, Queen of Scots. But an amazing uh, series of historical events kind of happen all at once. Is that Mary, Queen of Scots, is Catholic. And she's happily living in France. She was the Queen of France. She was married, married to the king. The and uh, the regent, Mary of Guise, who's been running uh, Scotland, dies. So Scotland decides that, well, geez, her daughter's over here in France. She can come back and, and run Scotland. The problem is, Mary, Queen of Scots, is what religion? Catholic. 1560, I will repeat, the Scottish Parliament establishes the Presbyterian Church of Scotland is the official religion of Scotland. And now they're about to bring a Catholic queen back to Scotland. You have John Knox, whose life work was to establish the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. And just at the point that he thinks he has totally succeeded, what happens? A Catholic queen comes over to take over. There are forces, though, arrayed against Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, that we'll talk about, and I think it's the next slide or the slide after. And eventually, uh, she is deposed. And I certainly don't want to suggest that John Knox personally and solely deposed Mary, Queen of Scots, because there were other powerful entities who were involved in uh, deposing her, one of them being Liz. Queen Mary Elizabeth Queen Scott's uh, half-brother, James, is another one who uh, is claiming to be on her side. Hi, sis. Good to see you. But is secretly working against her almost from the time that she lands on Scottish soil. So there were significant forces arrayed against her from the beginning. But the theological force is John Knox. Uh, so Mary is finally deposed in 1567. 1587... Mary, Queen of Scots, is uh, beheaded by Elizabeth I. Why did I waste 20 years? So the, the final thing to mention about Knox is some of you uh, may uh, believe that he was anti-women, that, that he was not a prototypical early feminist. And the reason for this is his most famous work is a book called On the Monstrous Regimen of Women. And this book uh, is... He, his whole life, he was bedeviled by women named Mary. There's Mary of Geese, there's uh, Mary Tudor, and then there's Mary, Queen of Scots. So he writes this, this book on the monstrous regimen of women against the first two, against, well, look how rotten government we have when, when these women take over. And he wrote that. So you could view him as anti-women. However, when Elizabeth takes over as head of England, John Knox loves Elizabeth, and uh, they exchange letters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So by that point, he probably changes his views of, of female rulers.